you notice what we're going to get into, of course, this is put on by Dorman. Okay, uh, they're doing a real good job of it. I mean, I've been very excited since last year doing all this stuff. I mean, they're one of the world's biggest aftermarket uh, aftermarket uh, parts uh, uh, developers and sellers, of course, pretty near everywhere you go. And, and I'm not trying to sell anything because they, they really don't. When I do this, they're not over there saying, hey, sweet, sell products. But I just wanted to let you throw a little bone to them because it's very gracious of them uh, them to put uh, put these programs on. And I'm actually at the same time watching the chat box. Hopefully everybody gets to the chat box. They start saying, hey, uh, hello, 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 and all that stuff. So anyway, that's me. Uh, you're going to have a handout. What what Alex is going to do is on the chat box, and you see it over there already. I will put the handout here in the chat. It'll be in a PDF. So when you see that box over there in the chat box, you know when he gets it on, you'll see a little icon come on. Actually, click on it, and by all rights, you should be able to get a handout. So he's gonna. He told me he's gonna do it quite a few times throughout the program in case somebody misses it. You know, so but in your handouts, you will have my email over here. So if there's questions afterneath, afterwards, uh, go for it. You know, he hello, sweet. Somebody actually said hello, sweet. That's great. You know, <laughs> awesome. Uh, speaking of the chat box, uh, I made a little note so I don't forget. You know, my mind goes into jumping right into this stuff here. Okay, so what I did, and uh, by the way, don't worry about that slide there, just me, you know, accept me for what I am, you know, sometimes I get a little squirrely, but this is what we're going to get into. Speaking of the chat box, so again, back to that. I'm going to try to put 10 pounds of doo-doo in a 5-pound bale. It ain't going to happen, guys, okay? especially with a subject like the annual inspection. Okay, The annual inspection is quite, uh, it's got some complexities to it, and that's why I want to do that. You know, in, in the last, last uh, Lunch and Learn, a few guys were asking, hey, how about doing something in annual inspections? But anyway... I know I said it three times now. With the chat box, okay, and I'm anticipating, hopefully there's gonna be some uh, enforcement guys also, commercial vehicle enforcement guys watching this. So if you have questions, I, I'm gonna apologize up front. I can't constantly monitor, uh, monitor chat box. So feel free, especially enforcement guys, if I say something or somebody has a question on the chat box, Please, if you can help out, type in because the program I'm doing is not everybody's going to have access to 393 and 396. You can do me a favor. I know in my state, the commercial vehicle enforcement guys, we work together so much with a lot of these trainings here. You know, I go out and I do actual regulation training. So keep that in mind. So please do help out. Okay. Uh, so let's start getting into it. Oh, before we get into it, I made a little list of actually, it's call it my pet beef list, okay? Uh, pitfalls of doing annual inspections. Now, hopefully, this is why you're watching it too here, all right? And I list them in order lack of regulation knowledge, interpretation of regulations need to be more real world for comprehension. And I'll be honest with you, that's a, that's a huge one. I get calls all the time from other shops. You know, hey, I'm underneath the vehicle. I got this. Send me a picture. What are you seeing? And it's kind of, I'm kind of like, is this a you know violation? Should I reject this vehicle for inspection? And so on and so on. You know, so there's some complexities to it. And the reason is again, it's not very well written. Okay, so some of the regulations they do need to be rewritten, keep up with the real world issues. And by the way, the technology changes too. Okay. The big thing that I find is, and I get that when I get all these calls, is the regulations need to be uniform throughout the country. And it doesn't matter, regardless who is doing the inspection, everybody, everyone, whether it be an individual or state, needs to be on the same page. Okay. And my last very important bullet point, so, and again, I did that so I don't forget, my mind goes into 10,000 directions. Most important, training availability for everyone concerned with inspections to assure that everyone is following the 
same requirements and criteria. So I had to say that, get that out of the way, so we can into this stuff, all right? So with that first slide over here, Okay. Regulations require that commercial vehicles operate in, in interstate or foreign commerce pass inspection at least annually. Okay. Inspection requirements may be met through a periodic inspection program administered by the state or by self-inspection or an inspection performed by commercial garage or similar commercial businesses so long as inspection complies with federal standards. Okay. Bottom line is, does you know what, regardless of who's doing the inspection, that vehicle owner, that carrier, okay, is responsible for having the proof of inspection, okay. So now, let me, before I go to the next slide, let me do this, just in case I don't have an opportunity. So if you can hone in on this, right here, okay, this is the federal, I'm always going backwards here. This is a Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations Handbook. So I had in there Part 393 section in there. That's part of the inspection. But I'll be very honest with you. Everyone here that's over here doing inspections, and I'll find, find the right page here, okay? Uh, right here. Eh? You'll see on the bottom, okay? And usually, if, if I do live classes, everybody gets a little handbook. It says Appendix A to Part 396, minim Minimum part Periodic Inspection Standards. Get, get, get your stupid fingers out of the way, okay? But anyway, it's Appendix A. It used to be called Appendix G. Uh, they changed it over, I believe it was in February. So, But anyway, if you zoom in real fast, you know, you're not going to be able to read everything. But if you notice, everything is in there. If you, I, I did underline in red parking brake system, brake drum, or rotors. So you have a pretty good idea. This is your Bible. This is where you need to go into. And of course, that 393 section, eh, I'm going to find that real fast. That Appendix A is only a few pages, okay, but if you're doing an inspections, that's your minimum requirements. So this is your Part 393 section, okay, and it's parts and accessories, safe operation, and if you went into it, starts up there with subpart B, lamps reflect, starts with 393.9, and we'll cover that. 393 point, uh, you know, goes up to uh, 30, basically, what happens is. So there's a lot of good information there. The other book that you might want, okay, that you really should get, eh, and it's very, very handy, it's this North American Standard Out of Service Criteria. So what happens is, and I'll open up just randomly, I'll open up the page here just to give you an idea. Okay, you can stay, you can zoom in, zoom out for a second. You know, nobody wants to see my t-shirt. I'm just trying to find a right good page that might make sense that you appreciate. Oh, here. Okay. So if you look over here, you, you can zoom in now, you can see some tires down there. Okay, this is great because what this book actually does is all the enforcement guys use this to figure out that, you know what, the violations or the issues that you meet are in this book and if you get to that point, that vehicle is going to be put out of service. So the point I'm trying to make is chances are pretty good, okay, if your vehicle gets put out of service because anything found in this out of service criteria, eh, it's not gonna pass annual inspection. I'll be very honest with you. They are so, so closely aligned with it. To tell you the truth, at one time, if you got a clean inspection on the roadside, you you actually pass a annual inspection. They, they stopped that back in 2016. But this here, and everybody keeps asking me, where do you get, I belong to CBSA as a, whatever the industry industry person but most of the time it's all the states all the enforcement guys they get into it so it's if you zoom over there okay if you want you might want to mark that all you got to do is cvsa.org do yourself okay then uh you you really you know help yourself out you know and they're not they're not that expensive those books and to be honest with you if you purchase one this year 
every year whatever little changes they make it but you know what the little minor changes if you, if you do it just every other year you're going to be golden with that plus also it's a good resource for information in cvsa you know they're great people over there uh so we're going to work if you're going to do inspections it's going to be a commercial motor vehicle any self-propelled or towed vehicle used on a highway and interstate gross vehicle rating and I'm going to go fast because I urge you to go backwards. I've done lunch and learns on actual regulations and, you know, some of this stuff might be repeat. So don't worry about it. But basically in your handout, you'll see what do we define as a commercial motor vehicle. This middle one, let me just back up over here, has a gross vehicle rating, gross combination weight rating, vehicle, vehicle combination. Basically, you look at 10,001 pounds or more. And combination means that if you're, you've got a pickup truck, say it's 8,600 pounds, I'm just pulling numbers out of my head, okay? And if you got a trailer that's over 3,500 pounds, 4,000 pounds, do the math. You're over 10,001 pounds, and if you're earning a living, and if you're going interstate, and that's the other key, you know, you're, you're going to have to get annual inspection stuff. Now, I'll get to that who has to do annual inspections and so on in a bit, eh? But those are the criteria. So now the other thing you want to be, uh, want to get comfortable, and like I said, this book that I held, you don't have to zoom in, this book that I held out here, okay, this is where a lot of this information comes from, like the 396, 17, 19, okay. So it requires at least once every 12 months, and I mentioned to you Appendix A, minimum periodic inspection. The 15 inspection areas listed establish a condition a vehicle must meet past annual inspection. You know, some of the areas like lighting are referenced in other areas of the regulation. So for example, lighting devices, all lighting devices required by Part 393 shall be operable. So you have Appendix A, but you need the 393 to figure out what you're doing with your lights on annual inspection. Every commercial motor vehicle must be inspected as required by this section. Very important. Get comfortable with the regulations. I cannot emphasize that enough. Okay. The regulations in Part 393 in Appendix A, they do provide the conditions that the vehicle must meet in order to be operating on the roadways. Okay. The inspection must include, at a minimum, the parts and accessories set forth in Appendix A. I pose some questions here. This now I'm flipping over to the real world. Eh? We got the book world and now we got the real world. What does that mean? Can anyone doing inspections exceed this requirement? If so, how far can you exceed it? Can you shoot off the hip and decide what is passable and what is rejectable? What if you miss something critical? What if you reject something with no basis or criteria to back up your decision? And herein really lies the problem, okay? There's a lot of confusion about annual inspections. If you try to get in there and you try to figure out, I have this vehicle here, shoot this pass, where can I find this information? What if you decide you're gonna reject a vehicle for some odd reason, and that customer, that owner comes back and says, hey, wait a minute, you can't reject it. I went in the regulations. I see absolutely nothing about there spelled out. So you can see that, you know, we definitely need to do something about this. But we are working with annual inspections, so let's do the best we can. Now, federal annual period inspection. Again, we mentioned requires carriers performing self-inspections ensure that the individuals performing annual inspections are qualified so if you're a carrier okay you're gonna have to ask yourself the question oh wow i never realized that i got guys working in my shop they're gonna do federal annual inspections are they qualified to do i don't know you better have something on hand if you ever get audited to show that your shop guy is qualified to do that and i'll get to that and Make sure the inspection is prop done properly. I'm saying that again. As a carrier, you are still, repeat again, responsible for the inspection. 
Now, real quickly, if you get a chance, go into that 396, that's maintenance inspection in that green book I held up. All that stuff is in there. Motor carriers are responsible for ensuring individuals performing annual inspection under 396 are qualified as. I'll give you a bullet point here. Understand the inspection criteria set forth in part 393. I've already mentioned both of them and can identify defective components is knowledgeable of and has mastered the methods, procedures, tools, equipment used when performing inspection, is capable of performing inspection by reason of experience in one of the following, successfully completed state or federal training program. Well, states that have adopted, for example, the heavy duty inspections, chances are pretty good, okay? It's not necessarily a training program but i'll pick on my state new york state if you want to become a heavy duty inspector you got to go into in, in for a whole day they'll walk you through with a powerpoint do this do that it is not absolutely complicated at all and you got to pass a test okay but it meets the requirements you know just so you have an idea eh? uh, as a side note uh as a side note you also have a section 396.25. It provides qualification requirements for anyone inspecting, repairing, servicing, or maintaining brakes. This is not that kind of a, like you're doing the annual inspection. We call that a brake inspector, employee of a motor carrier, responsible for all tasks. The qualifications are somewhat similar, okay? The other thing I didn't point out too is a lot of times if you if you have somebody there, keep a paper file. If they, they have one year of hands-on experience of doing all that stuff, put it in a file. So if somebody comes and questions, hey, this guy's got hands-on uh, experience, they're comfortable of doing it, knows the tools and so on, okay? 2016, I know I did that, I believe in one of my other lunch and learns, but this is good time to revisit. ABS was also added. Prior to 2016, I believe it was June or July, you would get a violation on the it's a roadside if somebody pulled them over, okay, you get a violation. It wasn't a big, big thing for CSA points, but in 2016, they added it as an annual inspection. So now, if that vehicle comes in, you actually have to make sure, you have to assure okay, that your anti-lock brake system is working and so on. Okay? So that was added. Okay? The other thing, and this is kind of, this is huge. This is for you guys that actually work on it and you actually do these inspections, just think about this. Okay? Automatic slack adjuster, same time, in, I believe it was June or July 2016, it was added. Any brake that's found to be out of adjustment on initial inspection must be evaluated to determine why the automatic brake slack adjuster is not functioning. Problem must be corrected in order for the vehicle to pass inspection. It is not acceptable to manually adjust automatic brake adjuster without free. What we're saying here is that vehicle comes in to your shop in the day. If the brake was out of adjustment, you crawl underneath it, adjust it, you know, check the stroke and everything, put a sticker on it or whatever case you do, you know, the way you guys do in different states or if you do a federal annual, you can put a sticker on, basically you're saying it's okay, go down the road, okay? Now, that didn't fix the problem and that's been proven over and over again. It's like you adjusted it, you put your sticker on, the vehicle goes out, next week the brake's out of adjustment. So they figured that out, okay, that we're seeing a lot of brakes out of adjustment. Well, these are automatic brake adjusters. Why are they going out of adjustment? So they came up and says, look, you do not adjust it, okay? You don't put that sticker on, you don't pass it, unless you figure out first why is that brake out of adjustment. It could be the slack adjuster or something could have gone squirrely, but you need to do that, okay? So somebody's gonna stand around and say, well, are the feds gonna have like 10,000, <sighs> What can I call them? Automatic slack adjuster checker checkers? You know, coming to each shop? No, they're not gonna do that. But if, you know, all you gotta think about is if that vehicle gets pulled over on the side of the road, first thing, they're, one of the things they're gonna do is they're really gonna track and see, are you in compliant with a periodic inspection? You know, they're gonna look for a sticker, some kind of paperwork, and they'll see, oh yeah, Oh, I see the date. It was just done two days ago. Guy's gonna crawl underneath it, tell the driver step on the brake, 
enforcement guys person is going to take that uh, push rod stroke it's like oh my gosh look at that it's two and three quarter inches whatever the case may be you exceeded the push rod stroke you know what how is it possible that that sticker is on there so i you know what i'm saying how the system works okay so it's not a hard way to figure out this is how things happen now because of this this requires to look at possibly the whole system and other components that can cause automatic slack adjuster maintain the proper push rod stroke and this actually came right out of your appendix a i just transposed it into my powerpoint here assuming a little okay so now here you have a, it is just an example brakes a rod adjustment you got to figure out what's going on you're gonna crawl underneath it okay and of course you're gonna go over there uh, go up and down with it there's your like listen you know I, I realize you got good shoes and linings on it but your brake is out of adjustment right here is my problem and somebody's gonna have to make a decision if you want the sticker if you want it to pass you're the inspector you're the one that's watching here you're the, you're putting your name on it okay you're saying when you put your name on that you are actually saying that when that vehicle left everything is safe whether you pull something about out of there to look at it whether you take something apart or whatever i just wanted to throw that in there you're making a statement there so but anyway there's your out you know record of inspections qualified inspector performing inspection must prepare a report which identifies uh identifies uh name of individual and so on and so on and now that's in your handout okay uh must be housed for 14 months you know if for example you don't do state inspections you're going to have to put some kind of a sticker over there copy inspection report or, or or a decal okay i usually i recommend everybody you know do do both you can't go wrong okay placement of it is the feds don't care where you place it in some states they might you know in our state you want it someplace on the on the bumper you know we're in the front or someplace on the hood where you can see it and everything so you need to look and see what your requirements are specifically for your state if you do state inspection so now everything i did so far simplify take a meeting annual inspection requirements the vehicle can be inspected one of the state mandate programs new york registered based is one of those okay there's 23 states that have adopted periodic inspection requirements that fmca has deemed equivalent to its periodic inspection requirements inspected by a commercial shop inspected by your shop using a qualified technician inspected by a qualified inspector on site at your and again i know i'm going fast get a hold of that 393 uh, 396 section you know and it's got the whole section slow it down go through it it'll tell you what the requirements are now right off the bat i have an issue with this this comes right out of the federal motor carrier safety regulation states have adopted periodic inspection so the issue i see over here is that when i do a new york state inspection it is supposedly you know uh up to snuff it isn't i don't want to get into politics there's they're missing a couple of components in there i don't have time to talk about that you know the, adopting the regulations and whole and all that stuff but what happens is some of the trucks that get inspected in new york state and this happens state to state sometimes they'll get into that state and they'll get pulled over and somebody will say well no you don't have you're not you don't have a annual inspection yes i do i have a new york state inspection well technically the new york state inspection should qualify everywhere in the country okay but evidently doesn't so i have few carriers that are over there saying like you know what I, i'm getting tired of pulled over i'm getting a violation i have no inspection uh, just do me a favor put a new york state inspection because in new york if you're registered in new york and there's a few other states that do that too you automatically have to get a new york state inspection and do me a favor give me a federal annual inspection too you know so we get them both you know trying to please everybody but again that's one of the issues i see we're we're not really 
somebody's dropping the ball on this stuff, you know, so, and you wonder why we have problems. And here it is, my next slide. Now, I went up to date for 2023, January 2. This is, I went as far as the end of the August, and usually there's about 130, 140,000. What you're looking here is 129, thousand blah 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 cited for operating commercial motor vehicle without proof of periodic inspection believe it or not up to this point it makes it the third place for most common vehicle maintenance violations yes last year in 2022 it was the second one okay so i gotta think about this okay first place of course is lights that's a no brit that's an easy pick and of course 83,000 cited for brakes but let's go back to this vehicles that have no annual inspection you're required to have it so let me do a little real real world over here so a vehicle comes into a shop and you find a say say for example you find a deficiency whatever the, the vehicle needs brakes drums da, 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 da. maybe it's the type of a place that the guy says you know what <sighs> I don't have time to stop right now. I got to get going. But your sticker, your inspection is over too. I can't stop. Okay, I can't go. Or I don't have money or whatever the case may be. And guess what that guy's going to do? Do you think he's going to park that vehicle or that fleet's going to park that vehicle and just say, throw up their hands? Well, I'm going to, you know, wait a month. No, they're going to drive this thing, you know. So a lot of it, I venture to say, is contributed to that, you know. Uh, today, you know, you should be good. That part as a driver is when you do your pre-trip, you need to look, is my inspection up to date? So either way, somebody's you know dropping the ball on this but i'm just throwing my two cents in on this okay i want to ask you this if you zoom in on this just to give you an idea is everything good here okay and i'm going to try to put a lot of stuff in here so i'm going to give you a tip here okay if you follow this line over here this one right here okay I just wrote an article to CVSA about that. I'm starting to see quite a bit of this. See where this line goes up to the modulator valve, the relay valve? That is your service line. Now, if you notice, this chamber is quite dirty. It's been on there quite a while. That hole there, and if you want to reference it, you can go into my uh, disc brake ones. I think I did some stuff on the uh, regular brakes 101 for lunch and learn. These two lines are reversed here, guys. This one needs to be here. So now what happens is when guys do that, they'll adjust this kind of to a bad adjustment you know and that usually happens if they change the chamber or anything but my point being is okay this vehicle is going down the road it's still being driven up and down up and down so now if you're the one doing the annual inspection and you don't catch this you might have somebody step on the brake and the push rod will come out a little bit and say oh it's okay hurry on you go look at the other push rods and you might have missed this whole thing so what will happen is if this vehicle ever gets in an accident okay, and somebody has to do what we call a post on it and God forbid, if, especially if it's a fatality, you're going to get some wise guy, not, I shouldn't say that, once in a while I'll do that myself, I guess I'm wise ass is investigator. But anyway, somebody's going to come along and they might discover something like that and it's like, oh, who worked on it last? Who, who put the last sticker on? So again, it's so important. That's part of doing annual inspection. How knowledgeable are you into doing this? Okay. Yes, uh, I see the chat. So New York only need to do New York State inspection. Yeah. Again, let me emphasize this. Okay. Need to do New York State inspection. Okay. If you're New York State registered. So if you register your vehicle in, in New York State, okay you go to get a license and stuff you have to get a new york state inspection if you're not registered in new york state no you don't have to you know if you're driving through or whatever the case may be you know but along with that i'm looking at the chat box and this is where i said in but new york state inspection 
Okay, now New York State had adopted the federal ones, meets the requirement of the federal annual inspection. So yes, if you're registered in New York State, yes, then you have no choice. You have to get a New York State inspection. Okay, uh, I hope I cleared that. You know, this one came in for annual inspection from a fleet with shop. Uh, safety big shop look at the angle of the push rod I'm just trying to make a point here right? the angle is way off right? now this is same vehicle but on the other side it's in the right hole well again how would you treat that in an annual inspection it's not correct furthermore would you be able to find that okay and that's the point i'm trying to make with some of these slides that i'm going to go through here you know you're still ultimately responsible if you put that sticker on okay you're the one you're saying everything is hunky dory but it can't be hunky dory because when you're going to have a performance issue this is a lever if you have it on the wrong hole, you are, you are playing with the forces from side to side and you're going to have imbalance with the braking system. So again, take it for what it's worth. Eh? We need to be quite knowledgeable. Here's another one, inspection. What do you see? But more important, why? This thing is bent. Okay. Sometimes, I'll be very honest with you, a lot of the stuff we discover, we find in... Uh, it doesn't matter if it's just, you know, on inspections, could be on diagnostics or whatever. It's, it's pretty near, I don't have the exact figure, but someplace between 70, 80%, they're really man-made. We, we call them cinches since somebody worked on it. So keep that in mind too, you know. And I can get into huge, huge discussions on that kind of stuff. So look at this. Okay. If you notice when that steering wheel was turned, it did what? It's crimping that line over there. And this is a perfect example of cinch shoe. And actually at the same point, if you look over here, okay, that's been on a while. It just didn't happen yesterday. You know, it's not rocket science to see all the, you know, dirt and accumulated stuff from the road and nature and everything on there. Here's another one. Eh? This isn't a huge leak. To be honest with you, you might not even hear it, okay? Or you might. But again, this leak is not gonna fix itself. The other problem I have with the regulations, you, I want you to go into Appendix G, uh, Appendix A, excuse me, I'm still in the old habit, Appendix G, Appendix A, and you go into 393, and I want you to find, you know, where you can get defined, should you be failing it, should you not, and so on and so on, okay? In the out of service criteria book that I showed you, there's what we call the air loss rate that they have to go through and everything else. But bottom line with this is, look, I can show you a lot of technical stuff and everything else. God gave us the best set of tools that you will ever, ever have. You got your brain, you got your hands, you got your ears. You know, I mean, you know, it's the greatest tools. We just need to learn, and your gut feelings sometimes are good too in it. So, you know. Now, watch this, close in on this. We're not applying. He came all the way. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I want you to look at some of this stuff here. And I got my son Bron here with me because he's the one that actually did the diagnosis. So, looking at this side, what are you seeing here? A little bit of a hint. You got a couple issues here. One hit the brakes. And I, I might not go through the whole video because we got a lot to get through over here. Right. Also pointing out, not that it has to do with the brakes, but this is a perfect example, you know, of other issues. So we're going to move, and you said which axle now? Same, same, same thing, thing here. Things. Okay. All right, what are we seeing here? This is a good one here. See the pin missing? A couple of things over here. 
And is that the wire you said was cut for the ABS? That's one of them. Okay, that's one of them. Hey, might as well pop it off. It ain't so doing no good. No good there. All right, where are we heading now? Going over to the other wheel. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to try to do one more shot here. Sorry, we do not have a lift that lifts up trailers. So I'm going to try to get close over here. Just so you know, in case you missed it, what should have happened, look at the slack adjuster. Now, I'm going to go by the wheels. Yeah. Oh, there we go. And the shoe's quite a way away from the drum. Okay. And I'm going to try to get a good picture of the bottom here. To Just be patient. Like Look closely over there. The roller is out of the shoe. It's out of the there shoe go. right there. Okay. And same thing here with the ABS, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah, this one. Yeah, cut right through. For the for the sake of time, okay, I'm going to stop this. For the sake of time, okay, what happened was this vehicle came in, you know, the driver is complaining, I don't have, you know, I don't think I have good brakes and everything, you know, and he truly had nothing really. So I'm, I'm surprised he was able to make it in. But if you looked at that, uh, let me back up. If you looked at this, all that stuff isn't that old, is it? I mean, if you, those of you that work on that stuff, you, you, I guarantee you, you get about a good 95%, 90% aligning, okay? You'll see up here, you know, for your uh, Alex uh, slack adjuster, your little rod over here that's used to make sure you're gonna go to braking is, uh, is missing. If you notice the jam nut is missing over here, and if you notice before on that other portion with the video the roller was out okay and one of the reasons is yeah you can back out one of the reasons is when we finally got into it whoever did this brake job they actually had the cams wrong from side to side and this was another vehicle that had the chamber hoses around and I guess the reason I'm trying to show you some of this stuff is that this is why we have to do annual inspections. This is why we have commercial uh, vehicle enforcement people out there to hopefully try to catch this stuff. We don't work in a perfect world. I'm going to tell you all day long, most fleets, most owners, most trucks, they really care about safety. It's just these type of things we need to catch. There are accidents waiting to happen, okay? So again, these are things as an annual inspection, you need to try to catch it, okay? Uh, let me see, you know, no, no chats yet. Okay? If you go, for example, if you go e either into your Appendix A in your federal uh, safety regulation book or that North American out of criteria book. These are the areas. This is your information. What should my push rod stroke be? So for example, here we have a typical type 30, your standard. Okay. Two inches is the readjustment limit on that. I'm going to, and if you watch some of my other videos, I'm going to, and, and maybe I should, but the manufacturers usually say, hey, when you get done with that brake job, make sure you don't readjust that uh, CVSA, they actually call it push rod, exceed that push rod limit. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, two inches, wiped it out of your head if you're actually working on this, that stuff try to and i'm just pulling a number get it way down below two inches if you can and there are vehicles yeah you're going to be about inch and three quarter whatever the case may be however what happens is say for example you're at inch and seven eighths and now this driver comes down the road he's had to use the brakes quite a bit and he's going downhill and applying the brakes the brakes get hot drum expands push rod stroke is gonna go and it might go over that two inches and lo behold maybe uh you know you're doing an annual inspection or maybe we got pulled over and of course if you're doing annual inspection you pull the vehicle in quickly it probably might not pass 
okay? You might misconstrue it as a slack adjuster being bad. So again, word of warning, as technicians, let's keep that limit down, okay? I've never been happy about any, you know, people saying, hey, don't exceed that. Bullshit, excuse me, bull. Keep it down below as good as possible. Permanently crimped seal service chambers are considered clamp type, okay? So the other thing is we've gone into long strokes, a little bit of a warning, and you, in my other brake stuff, I'll hold a long stroke chamber. I did it in disc brakes and stuff, you know how to identify them. But if notice, you've got the trapezoidal tags on some of these, and you'll see over there, it might say two and a half inch rated stroke, two and a half inch stroke. Okay? Please do yourself a favor, don't don't go by this. Don't say this is a two and a half inch. How do you know that's my stroke? always verify so for example here you have a type 20 service chamber if you zoom in over here a little bit more okay now over here okay, you'll notice two and a half inch rated stroke but what is the actual limit two inches so again as a warning don't your best bet is rtfi read the freaking instructions the instructions again are in those books that i showed you earlier release it step out of it you you might get a you might get a dump truck that comes in okay you might get a dump truck that comes in and say, for example, in our area, it hasn't been used for six months. The guy's going to put it on the road, let it sit for winter months. Hey, I needed an annual inspection. You come in, you're going to do it, have somebody step on the stroke. They're going to step on the stroke. Oh, wow, this is great. This is like, you know, half an inch stroke. How can you go wrong with that? Three quarter inch stroke. Be careful. Visualize your eyes, head, ears. They're all tools, guys. If you notice, Right there, we got triggered that it's like, that's not really right. When it went to return, it didn't want to return all the way. So we force it to return, and on the next step, it boom, it shot way out. So these are all things you got to keep in mind. Reject, vehicle's not going to pass. Okay. All right, Pat, release the brakes. Step on them. They're not released, Brad. In. You're kidding. Buttons in. Cause it, other issues. Yep. Cause and effect. If you looked at the lining we're always pointing at, guys. Uh, okay, let's go through that again. You know. Other issues because it's not moving at all. All right. Well, either way, he's probably been running with the button now. Yeah. There's no lining left. All right. so. Now, what basically happened is that evidently it's not releasing and there's no lining left. Guys, let me tell you something right now. There is no lining. That's your shoe. That's your table. I see no lining whatsoever over there. How long has that been going on? The other problem is our window of opportunity. It's the only place you can see that. Okay. So again, in your regulation books, in Appendix A and in the 393 sections, all of them, I plucked this out of, out of service just to prove a point. If you go into 393, if you go into Appendix A, and if you go into out of service, you're going to find the same stuff. Okay, lining wear, quarter inch, and so on. All right, miss and break on any acts are required. Okay, by the way, my bet peeve of this, I bring it up every time I do disc breaks. This eight inch, eighth of an inch for disc brakes, that's BS. And I've shown, it's like they need to rewrite this. I mean, eighth of an inch is absolutely nothing. You're allowing quarter inch for this guy here, but you're not allowing, you know, uh, you're not allowing to go below quarter inch on that one, but you're allowing it to go on disc brakes. I mean, somebody needs to get in the real world and revisit, but that's another story. The other issue is, so you're doing an annual inspection. So if basically in a lot of states they tell you if you can if you can see all the components or whatever you're good you don't have to pull a wheel okay so this kind of coincides with not pulling a wheel so right here okay here this little plug this hole 
you know, picture the drum is on and everything is on, you're on the other side, you pull it, and that lining is gonna look great. Oh my gosh, I got some good lining. But if for some reason you have to pull it, you'll see it all concaved here. It's, you can see, it's worn down to hardly nothing. So again, be forewarned, if there's something ever happens with this vehicle, it's like, and somebody's gonna go through, it's like, oh my gosh, why did somebody put a new sticker on it? You know, so. Drums, how would you know this drum is worn? Of course, you go into your books and stuff, and what happens is they'll tell you discard limit and stuff. In New York State, okay, you're gonna have to use, you can stay there, I'm gonna, I'll bring the meter here, you know. In New York State, you have to use one of these, okay. Actually, you have to have it on hand. You know, if they come in and check your tool inventory, you have to have it. Uh, but basically what happens, there is discard limits, and uh, basically I put you out of service, you know. The other thing is, how would you treat this? I'm gonna tell you right now, throughout the years, disc rotors are so hard to figure out they really are you know I mean you got the 75 percent rule you don't have a window of opportunity all I'm asking you guys right now is if you're watching this I'm asking a question how would you treat this okay and if you don't know go into those books I had in the beginning and I dare you to find out if you got guidance is to help you out okay? Brake drums, rotors, with any external crack or cracks, this right here, okay? And this is also in Appendix A, right here, drum with any external crack or cracks that open upon brake application, okay? This is another, somebody needs to rewrite this. If this was my car and my truck, okay, and you tell me that I'm okay, even though I have a huge crack in there, but it didn't open up, I, I gotta shake my head. I want you to tell me, even if you gotta bullshit me, that listen, you got such a huge crack in there, you need to replace the drums. You know, I don't wanna wait till this drum, somebody steps on it, you know? So I got a huge crack, and just because it didn't open up, it still is waiting for an issue to happen. If, you, if it's that bad, that you're on a cusp of it hasn't opened up or it will open up, you gotta be kidding me, you know? <laughs> and, and again, I have some issues here, you know. Any rotor with crack length of more than 75%. And again, I'm going fast, you got the handouts, but you go into the books, you know? Uh, I see, is there a handout for today? Uh, Alex said he's gonna put that you'll see the blue arrow down there if you click on that you should be get you should be able to get the handout so breakdown road inspection with any external crack any Porsche drum missing or in danger falling off services worn through center vents okay and again I again I mentioned a second time huge crack is okay unless it opens up upon brake application what can I say this is a disc brake. It could be a hydraulic disc brake. It could be a air disc brake. Remember, commercial motor vehicle, 10,001 pounds and over. Eh? What if this crack is underneath your caliper and the pads? All I'm saying is sometimes we need to rethink on how we do our inspections. You know. Now, here's a drum with a big crack over here. Eh? And I always mention, when I, when I do my brake classes and stuff, everybody's over there, oh my gosh, how can that even happen? How, why can't somebody find it? You want the truth? Sometimes I might have a hard time to find it. I might miss it. You might miss it. Why? Because if that drum was up on top, you got a dust shield behind it, and so on and so on. You're trying to squeeze your head in between a huge spring brake pack over there in the frame, I'm the first one to admit it, you could miss that. Anybody could, you know. So let's be, let's be realistic. When we do annual inspections, as long as we keep stuff like that in mind, you know, that it could possibly happen, maybe we'll do our inspections a little bit better, you know. And you notice here's a crack over here. Okay? This is another issue. Crack chambers. How would you treat this? Where would you look for any clarification? Part 393, Appendix A. So I'm just giving you some examples from out of service. Missing or broken brake shoe lining, return spring shoe chamber, anchor, and so on. Okay. 
Power parking brake spring or chamber mounting bolt. Well, definitely the power brake spring. I see a cock that's over, so I'm gonna fail it. But you know, the whole thing is how comfortable are you with all this stuff? Should I fail it? I didn't find it, you know? And the biggest thing out there is that who is out there putting a program together that we're all going to be on the same page you know i don't care if it takes two days to do something you know training or something this is what you do everybody's on the same page okay uh i'll give you an example so from my new york state check your own states new york state heavy duty check your own state again parking brake condition of parking brake components reject if any of the following are missing defective cotter pins, retracting springs, right there, worn rods, couplings, cables are visibly frayed or frozen, eh? ratchet pull lever control, and so on. Any non-manufactured hole or cracks are found in a spring brake housing section of a park brake. So New York State, this portion of it did a good job. Any cracks, so, you know. Uh, how do you check a park brake? What are the regulations? What are requirements? The following will show that regulations are not perfect. You are inspecting a medium duty truck with hydraulic service brakes and drive line park brake. In Appendix A, no brakes on the vehicle combination are applied upon actuation of parking brake control, including drive by hand. So in Appendix A, they say, hey, put the park brake on. Oh, I didn't see anything move. Okay, you fail it. But what if you saw something move? What if you saw the shoes come on the drum or you felt it or whatever the case? Okay? So now let's take the next phase. Out of service is the exact same thing. No brakes on vehicle combination. You pull the button, you pull the lever, whatever the case may be. Okay. Now it also says in 393, the regulation book in the hydraulic brake vehicle, parking brake shall be capable of holding vehicle combination of vehicle stationary under any condition of loading, which it is found on public road, free advice. Okay, air brake is worded similarly. So let's actually look at the requirements. So I went into, on the hydraulics 105, Parking brake system on multiple purpose passenger vehicle, truck, bus, you'll see it, or you have it in your handouts, shall be capable of holding vehicles stationary for five minutes in both forward and reverse direction, 20% grade. But we don't have a 20% grade, okay? You're working on flat ground. And of course, the same thing if it's over, you know, for five minutes, 20, this is if it's over 10,000 pounds. So how would you check to, how would you check to see if it meets this requirement? I'm just asking a question. Then we go to Appendix A, out of service, do not specify, they don't tell you how to check the vehicle, okay? Now, they might verbal if you go through some training, do this, do that, and everything else, you know, to check it, okay? In my state, first of all, they used the light vehicle criteria. Set the parking brake. So New York State did say in theirs, how would you do it? Recheck the parking or holding a brake will not hold the vehicle stationary with engine running at a slight accelerated speed with shift lever and drive. Okay, so let's think about it. Let's discuss there. Is the difference try to move a vehicle? Is the difference if you're going to try to move a vehicle between automatic transmission and manual? Absolutely there is. You know, you might have to boost up that acceleration so you don't stall it if you're using a manual. Okay, you have all this stuff in the handouts, but I'm trying to make a point here. So have you ever replaced driveline style park brakes, new drum shoes, and it won't it wants to move, not lock up, but you put it on a grade, it holds. The other question I always ask too is, does every inspector follow the same criteria? Does every inspector accelerate equally while in gear? There is a disconnect between holding and testing. What would you do if you got a violation? Have you accidentally driven a vehicle with a park brake on, release it, and it still seems to be okay? A lot of food for thought okay so I'm not we're pushing time here I'm get you have this in the handout this is just basically plucked out about what it says in the federal motor with the air brakes and so on great holding let's move on to no park brakes on the vehicle combination applied them on actuation okay we're gonna jump into lights right now this is an easy one guys let me uh, let me real fast uh, Real fast, say something. I'm looking at the clock. We're getting pretty damn close. I'm going to get into lights. And I told you up front that we're going to have a little bit of an issue. I might not be able to finish everything. So we'll try the best we can. You have the option. Stay on. Okay. I'm, I, 
I don't mind staying over it all. I'll probably wind up staying over a little bit. And even afterwards, if it's past the time, if you got to go, go. You can get the recording again, so you're not going to lose anything out. You'll get the full recording. I'm going to keep the recording going. And afterwards, too, when we're done, I'll try to stay on a little bit. So if you're still on and you want to ask some questions, let's do a little question and answer after I get done. But let's see if I can get this done in about 10 minutes. So be patient, and I will understand if you got to drop out. You know, if you drop out, I'll try to look at a box. Just say, hey, this worked for you or it didn't than whatever the case may be. Lighting regulations, they are in your book. Oh, they're Highway Traffic Safety Administration, they regulate the lighting requirements. Primary focus is on new vehicles, okay? That's a Federal 108. So if you ever have a chance, go in there. It spells everything out with lights, what's required, what isn't. And it gets transposed into your regulation book in the 393 and so on and so on. Now, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration focuses on regulating already in-service commercial motor vehicles. They utilize enforcement of safety regulations. I had that's a green book to ensure motor care, ensure safety in motor care operation. Now, the feds work with state and local enforcement agencies and industry accomplish these goals. Okay. Into the mix, you'll also get the Society of Automotive Engineers. They basically write the standards and the criteria when it comes pretty near anything on your vehicle i don't care what it is for brakes for lights for windshields you name it they're the engineers they're great guys they do that you know uh, however uh, they do not have a legal authority however all entities rely on their input so many states with inspection program use the standards requirements and so on remember Lighting requirements, really the bulk of it is you're going to find it in 393. So what happens is in Appendix A, I'm going to jump through this, when it comes for you to inspect the lights, there's not going to be information on it. It's just going to tell you refer to 393 section, 393 and so on up to 393.30. And everything you see in that green book, that is what you're looking for when you do inspections, okay? And that's why meant takes full circle back, okay? Now, is anything wrong here? And if I had time, I would wait and have something, I was I wasn't able hold on one second. I wasn't able to find anything about the rotor with half contact there. Is there a place where this is referenced? I looked in three as appendix A with no except the parts as safe and reliable. You Dave, that's the whole point I'm trying to make here. Okay. You're not gonna there's a reference to as far as you know, do not consider surface rust as rust and so on. Okay. And you you I am so glad you asked that question. Because, again, all these years I've done this, that, you know, I personally would like to have a clear choice here. You know, because you might see a little bit of rust on that rotor or whatever the case may be, and you're going to say, nope, I'm going to fail it. Somebody else will try to do some research as well. I think I heard something about half contact, something about this, something about that, and they might let it go. And that is a huge issue, Dave. I'm so glad you asked that question. Good question. But anyway, right here, if you go in the table in 393.11, okay, you'll see it requires a red lamp. Zoom in on this over here real fast. So what happens is, without you getting a book, and 393 to 393.11, you're going to have similar pictures like this. Now, I got this, a, I have this in my shop, I have two of this. So if a vehicle comes in and I need to figure out, hmm, I'm not quite sure if this is correct, this is right from the feds, okay? All you do is you go look at the picture, the dump truck, and then you match the numbers, and it'll tell you it needs to have this, it needs to have this, and so on and so on. That book is great. I just happen to, if you look, you know, it, I like the colored version much, much better. It makes my life easier, you know. So again, go in that table. Brand new truck, you're doing an inspection. Is there anything wrong? Now, I'm going to jump into this real fast. Yes, there is. Okay, there is because I don't see a red reflector over here. 
Okay, so on that old poster that we saw there, it would tell me I would need, a, this is a brand new truck, okay. So again, put a reflector on, it came for inspection. I mean, obviously, you know, the brakes and everything was okay, but I still had to do that, you know. And the reason is, real fast, in case you didn't know it, okay, if this marker would have had an A on it, an A would represent a reflective light, I probably wouldn't have had to do this. But it didn't have an A on. Eh? What are the regulations for this? Now you're going to see a bunch of LEDs out. Okay, So if you go in your regulation books and lights, there really isn't anything in there. Okay, So I usually tell people, you know, when, 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 when we do get together with the officers and we get together, I, we have that discussion and I bring up the point that you can't write a violation because you got a percent shot until somebody in Fed says 20% of the LEDs out or whatever the case may be. But be careful of your own state. In New York State, in annual inspection, they, and they, that's not why they put it in there, but in New York State says when you turn the switch on, every light has to operate properly. So in New York State, and I verified it, if this came into my shop, one LED out, two is out, I will turn around and tell that customer I'm not going to put a sticker on until you replace that tail light. But the bottom line is, here's the issue. Okay, I can talk to a hundred people, whether it be drivers, whether it be owners, whether it be shop people. They're there. Oh no, it's twenty percent. It's thirty percent. It's this. And my next question is, where did you get that from? And I did venture say they can't come up with an answer. This one is huge. You're going to start seeing some of this stuff. Okay, as good as the feds are, right, they allow some lights to go through, and these are legal. Okay? And let me see if I can click on this. Now I'm looking at it sideways. The bottom line with this is, now I'm looking sideways, all the lights are on. I can't see anything over there, okay? So we're gonna step on the brake. So right there with this manufacturer, you can back up because we're trying to push time here, okay? Right there with this manufacturer, I'll be very honest with you. Somehow everybody thinks this okay. Well, if I'm looking straight ass on on the tail of that light, I'll see all the red. But I just proved to you, if I'm to the side, I'm going to have lack of seeing some indicators or something on. So again, as good as the feds are sometimes, they can miss some of this stuff, you know. Uh, I'm going to skip okay. this. We're, we're going to, I'm going to, I wanted to get this. So you have it in the handout. So get comfortable with this. The thing I'm trying to point out here is, do you know what P2 or P3 rating is? And so on and so on. So for example, it's marked in there in the regulations, you know, in the 108, rear clearance lamp, two red lamps, P2, PC, or P3, PC rated, mounted at widest point symmetrically, okay? What does PC mean? Eh? P2 clear side mark identification. This marking found on lamps is currently used for both over, just be patient with me, over, uh, over 80 inch and under 80 inch vehicles. Seems to be the standard, okay? P3 clear side marker ID lights for use on vehicles over 80. P3 designated lamp has a higher light output than P2 rated lamp. It is legal wherever P2 rated lamp. So when these manufacturers came up with these vehicles, and I'll get to my trailer in short, they rate these lights and they will have them marked on the lights. Okay? So now to this PC, combination side marker and clearance. For this PC rated lamp to be used as a combination light, the lights have to be mounted on a 45 degree bevel at the corner vehicle. PC light can be used anywhere P2 or 3. What I'm trying to tell you guys is that you you would have sometimes you'd have to have a light here a light there you know uh, but you can get away on a 45 degree angle to have just one light meets the clearance over here and the side over here why because it's a special light it's a combination pc combination side marker and clearance lamp <sighs> here it is so what i'm gonna do is I'm going to real fast jump into this. 
So you pull a bullet light out. Okay. I'll stay here. You pull it, pull it light out. They both look the same. And if you, you probably can't zoom in any closer, can you? If you can't, they'll both look the same. This one here is a PC rated. So if you pulled out a PC, okay, you might just say, hey, give me a, give me a light bullet light. Somebody will sell you this one here, okay? And it could be just a regular P2 or P3. Now, I'm going to turn something on. The reason you're doing this, let me see if I can turn my trailer on over here. Okay. You might not see it that clearly. And maybe you, maybe you can. I, if I turn everything dark. But if you look over here, this is a P2, P3. But over here is a PC. So in the right conditions, you might see that this one here, the PC, is much brighter. And this happens with the bulbs. I, like I said, I put a PowerPoint, you can turn back over here. I put a PowerPoint together uh, just on lights. It's probably about an hour thing, if not less, okay? Because one of the enforcement people a few years ago asked me, it's like, why are we able to, we don't issue tickets and stuff, and that's why. Why would you concern yourself with that? In the long run, you know, it's not going to be a life and death situation. You're going to have a light. But just think about this. What if somebody, okay, got in an accident and whoever was on the ground or whatever happened, all it takes is one person say, well, in that condition, I didn't see this. And if you're an investigator, if you're an officer, you got to follow through with this. You got to follow through. Well, that person made a statement. Then you're going to follow through and you're going to go like, oh, maybe they're right. I didn't see it. If they would have seen that truck over there, just, you know, on the road, it stalled. The only thing was the reflectors and lights were on, but I didn't see the lights or something. Whatever the case may be, somebody's going to have to follow through. And there it is. They'll climb up there, and that particular person might know what a P2P3C is. And they're oh, this should have had a PC light in there, not a P2. So take it for what it's worth. Okay? In the book, you'll see similar stuff over here. Get comfortable. That 393.11 in the Federal Regulation book has all that stuff in there. Tells you where to put the lights and everything else. Now, you will see markings. I mentioned to you, you you see a A. So this one's a reflective light. So look for that, you know, if it doesn't have it on it. Now, you'll see a DOT marking here. Believe it or not, everybody says, oh, it's got to have a DOT marking. Nope. The only thing that has to have DOT markings on is headlights, whether it's a headlight lens or anything that shoots a light up front like that, you know. A lot of companies will put a DOT on there. So that's not the end to be continued in part two. We just begun. Okay. Now, part two, I'm trying to prime you up. I'll give you guys a little bit of a homework. You can zoom in on this. Okay. I just got this, uh, Matt sent it to me the other day, just two days ago. He's one of the enforcement guys. He says, here's another one for your collection. So for homework, I want to make sure, you know, maybe the possible answer I ask is, does it pass any inspection? Maybe it won't pass because of the bungee cord here. Hold down cord might not meet working load limit requirements. Okay, I'm just messing with you guys. You gotta have a sense of humor here once in a while. Again, so but that's what I'm trying to do. So if you have any questions, okay, uh, if you have any questions, like I told you, I'm gonna stay on a little bit. I know we went five minutes over. Part two is when we're going to get into, like, now we got over the caveats, you know, what's an inspection and everything else. We'll concentrate more, like, say, for example, tires, fifth wheels, and, you know, frames, stuff like that. We'll get a bunch of stuff together. But I'm going to tell you right now, in all honesty, two hours, does it, it just doesn't even begin to do justice for annual inspection. You know, it's one of those I've often thought of putting together a two-day actual course, a two-day boot camp, you know, with vehicles around, 
and anybody that has anything to do with inspection just do it we'll go through the regulations everybody will get a book uh, maybe I'll get an enforcement guy to help me out we'll go under vehicles we'll we'll massage these things we'll look at the uh, deficits that the federal regulations have to be honest with you I, 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 I keep saying I wish I could be on board with the feds and give my two cents into this stuff because I think in the long run we can do much much better okay if we change a few things okay but I'm just a little guy you know a little gog in the wheel here so but thank you again guys thank you again and look for that uh, look for part two I'm looking forward to it Okay. and uh, unable to locate link for handout uh, you have my uh, you have my email okay so if it just 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 shoot me a little on the chat box then I'm looking at it right now that's why my head is down on the camera if you liked it you know you know just just shoot me a little something you know yeah it was good or whatever the case may be because uh, believe it or not uh, it keeps me pumped up you know this way when my wife says you know every night you're spending time on you know regulations and trainings and stuff you know you know then I can turn around and say hey see it worked you know nice I appreciate that guys I really really do you know wow what the hell is that one chat he says what the hell go back to your other country just kidding guys just I'm just kidding you know <laughs> you know no thank you and uh, like I said you know oh what is your email turn the camera over there because if every anybody didn't get the if anybody didn't get the handout okay I'll put that up here it's O K S W E D E one at AOL man it's this guy old AOL.com don't if for some odd reason I don't answer it I get a thousand emails okay do not say I'm a jerk or anything please call me the best place if you want you can also hey I sent you an email idiot you didn't even answer it 716-874 eight seven four five I had to think five four five zero okay that's my shop number and one way or the other I'll you know one of us will always answer and with the shop number I guess hey I was on that you know thing and please 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 if you got any questions I know a lot of my enforcement friends we all network we work with each other if you got questions ask because I learn from you guys you might be doing something on an inspection that I haven't I haven't kind of uh, run across it believe it or not I learn as much from you guys as hopefully you guys get from me because when we get our heads together I think we can figure things out much much better you know so but we're gonna we're I'm gonna sh couple more minutes and then we're gonna shut it down you know no no I thank you so much guys I really do appreciate it you know after all these years finally everybody thinks they well we're gonna shut it down and thank you you got my email you got my phone number anytime you have a question okay please please ask give me a shout and like I said you know call on the phone okay thank you hold on hold on don't don't shut it down can you do reviews break and suspension testing equipment we are thinking of no longer doing only visual testing okay uh, you must be talking about one of those uh, uh, 
uh, you must be talking uh, about one of those where you drive on and it does the brakes and suspension. Years and years ago, I got involved with NFT. I do, uh, that's our transit authority system there. And I talked them because I don't have the kind of money to do that stuff. But I talked them into getting a hunter system that you drive the vehicle over, step on it, it checks suspension and so on. I find that... Uh, if you're a super, super, super big fleet, you know, you might look into get it. They're quite pricey and stuff, but I, I'll tell you right now, it, it kind of makes sense. And that's what the buses, the transit people do. Besides having a Tapley uh, decelerometer, they'll go on, uh, they'll drive the bus, they'll drive over it, they make a break. And it very quickly, you can have one bus, two bus, three bus, and so on and so on, okay? So, you know, uh, let me think about it. You know, shoot me an email or something, and uh, that's a good, good, you know, great class as a forensic crash investigator. Two will definitely cover a great deal. Hey, you know, absolutely, you know. What do most shops charge customers for federal DOT inspections as far as time goes? That, that always has been an issue, you know, because if you're doing a good inspection, you know, really your shop has to make the determination. It's like, I'll, I'll give you an example in New York State. Uh, it's a mandatory $20 to do a heavy duty inspection, which is equivalent to a federal. Well, I'll be very honest with you. If you look at the labor rate today, for twenty dollars, and this is what I don't like when somebody comes back. You know, the inspections are bogus. It's a money maker. They're not a money maker. They absolutely for twenty dollars. I I shoot this. Sh <laughs> I'll keep calm. I shoot it right back. Okay, you you guys know what I was gonna say next. I'll shoot it right back. Where the hell can you go for twenty dollars? Have somebody crawl underneath that vehicle and do that inspection that you are not gonna go underneath and do it. Think about it, for twenty dollars. And don't get me wrong, there are places that do the lick them and stick them. They just here I'll give you a sticker. But you're doing a discharge. Uh, you're doing a disservice to everybody, you know. Uh, so again, for federal inspections, I do some for some third parties. You know, I believe it's Emirate or Lease Plan. You can get anywhere from eighty-five to hundred twenty dollars. But if you and and a lot of it too is, you will spend some time. You know, I look at you get what you pay for, and that's not unreasonable at all for you to ask for that. And the reason it isn't because keep one thing in mind when you sign a piece of paper and you put your name on it you're taking the responsibility not the driver nobody else you are basically saying i inspected the vehicle and by placing your name on it all i'm saying that everything works that vehicle is safe so always keep that in mind so somebody says, I had the Hunter brake suspension alignment. It was great, but unfortunately, they stopped making them repair parts. Tester was for cars and light trucks. They did have a heavier duty one, by the way, for the buses. And I did have a company. I'm going to have to go backwards to see if they're still in existence. I actually had it in a shop. I did some training and some demos for them. You know, it was a kind of a great thing, okay? So, uh, but Hunter has had the ones for cars, light trucks, and unfortunately, I'll be very honest with you, uh, right there with as pricey as it is, I'm sure Hunter probably looked at, gee, we're not selling that many, why, why would we even bother? You know, so the, you know, the other thing too is, man, I'm on a roll today. You're also seeing the future and a lot of states are testing them, you know, where the infrared with the heat, heat detection, you're driving down the road and it's supposed to detect the heat on it. You know, so it's the vehicles, it's basically, it's, you know, if you guys got infrared thermal guns and stuff, you're doing the same thing. So they look for a wheel that is hot. So if something's out of kilter, they'll pull it over. I was my worry is and I, I I need to get I need to get a hold of some of these people and see what the algorithm is because in the real world the other flip on the go to the other extreme what 
if that break doesn't get hot? Why would it not even get warm? Okay, because they're looking for something that is extremely warmer than the rest of the wheels, or one axle is warmer than the other. But what if it doesn't generate any heat? I basically still like my actually looking. What in that case, like we had that uh, on the video, the service brakes weren't working. You're, you're slipping by, you're letting vehicles slip by, you know, unless there's something I don't know about the algorithm and I'd like to check into it. You might let something slip by, it's like the brakes aren't even working on this freaking vehicle, you know. You're, it's so we need to do a balance over here. So, well, I am 15 minutes over. You will get that recording, so, you know, got the email, missed the phone. Can you put it in chat box? Uh, let me see if I can write it. Uh, how about, let me, let me just say the, or, yeah, or show it again. 716-874-5450, okay? And just ask for a suite. We're a small place. It'll be either my wife or my son will answer the phone, whatever. And just basically, again, just say, hey, listen, I was on the, uh, on the uh, lunch and learn, I got a question, or I just want to network, or whatever the case may be, go for it. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, my stomach's crawling. So thank you again. Signing off. Be good. See you guys next month. Thank you.